So I would like to introduce Dr. Martin Steele, who is a simulation analyst at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. His primary responsibility is the NASA standards for models and simulations. He leads an agency-wide team in developing standards, implementation guidelines, and best practices for developing models and simulations. Martin has over 40 years of experience with NASA and the U.S. Air Force. He has degrees in electrical engineering from Ohio Northern, a master's in simulation modeling, and a Ph.D. in industrial systems engineering, both from Central Florida. Please welcome Dr. Martin Steele. you got to turn your mic on. Um, Martin. Got yeah, the camera great. part. Um, and am I sharing yet? You're good. And you can see my uh, charts too? All looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, not, not great feedback that all that's uh, going through. So thanks for the feedback, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a really nice opportunity uh, that Mark has offered to me. And uh, because it seems like we're hitting all time zones across the world, uh, and I hope we can keep the uh, Pacific Coast people interested in waking up enough with their first cup of coffee and all the way around uh, through the people who are um, maybe hitting nightfall or into nightfall now. So this is a really interesting virtual opportunity, um, uh, quite different from doing it in person. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going to talk about the agenda for today is we're going to talk about what models and sims are in a, in a very general and quick way, the importance of model quality, the tenets of NASA standard for models and sims, and uh, just a quick introduction to the public collaboration website that we've developed and published this year. So the basics are MNS, this, this ubiquitous term that we see quite a bit called MNS. And uh, depending on the communities in, uh, that you happen to be talking to, even within NASA, that acronym can mean many different things. Um, just as a matter of uh, perspective, the NASA standard, <clears throat> which we'll introduce uh, more as we go through this uh, talk, uh, we decided to have it mean models and simulations. <clears throat> Other communities within NASA throughout the world might use uh, the more active phrasing of modeling and simulating, okay? And it, it, depending on your perspective and what you're used to, that term can mean a certain thing. But in general, and usually you can tell by context what the term means, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but in general, for, for our purposes today, it means the product or the, the usable thing called a model or a simulation. Uh, the other topic that comes up with this, of course, is analyses. And that can mean a lot of things to different people, but for this particular context, an analysis is using an MS to inform some real-world situation. Okay, that's the whole purpose, right? Uh, models and sims don't exist in and of themselves for themselves, at least in the business and industrial world. We really want them representing something in the real world and, and helping us make decisions in the real world. Okay, so you might think models and sims have probably existed since the beginning of time, essentially, right? Um, They've always been built, at least in the historical time frame uh, of our world. But what is new now is the ubiquity of computers and also modelers. <clears throat> with having a computer on everybody's desktop, with things like uh, Word, 
PowerPoint, or I should say a, a document uh, application, a spreadsheet application, a presentation application. It all allows us to be modelers in some fashion. And when you get into some spreadsheets, they can be extremely complex models of certain things. Um, and anybody can build them if they want. So the question comes in, how do you know it's any good? Which gets to the topic of model quality. Well, in NASA, we of course use models all the time. From the very beginning of a program to its very end, when you happen to go through a full system life cycle, like I did in my career. I wasn't quite here at the beginning of the shuttle design program, but I came in to shuttle at the very beginning of operations, and that was a very fruitful period of my, um, my professional experience, as you might imagine. Uh, graduating from college and coming to watch uh, something like a shuttle being launched. Um, so we use them all over the place, from manufacturing to launch processing and launch itself, through the mission and into landing. And I like to keep these pictures positive. Um, you know, we have a mindset in NASA w w that we're always very success-oriented, okay? And we don't like to think about the bad things that happen, like we did in the shuttle program uh, in a big way twice, unfortunately. And we're both, uh, we're all familiar, I think, with the Challenger accident and the Columbia accident. Um, even so much so that when we think about things when, that we're modeling, uh, and this is a true story, believe it or not, uh, we wanted to put something in the handbook in particular that goes along with our standard that is a standard engineering thing called an exploded diagram. We included the diagram, we had some text to go with it in the handbook, and we labeled it an exploded diagram. And there were more than one fairly stern comments that came along with that, that we in NASA don't want anything to do with an exploded diagram of anything. So I was strongly encouraged by my management to come up with another term, and we call those things now expanded diagrams. So the history of our NASA standard started from the Columbia accident in 2003. There was a couple of uh, uh, subsequent uh, reports that came out, studies and reports that came out, along with an action that said NASA shall um, develop a standard for models and for the development and use of models and simulations. And we published the first version, the baseline version, in 2008. Um, and, and followed a few years later by a handbook. And then we went into a, a fairly typical five-ish year cycle of revising the standard, should it need to be done. Okay. So we published Rev A, Rev -A in 2016, followed by the handbook. And we are, you are here just prior to us getting into the publishing of the RevB standard. So from a NASA perspective, you know, we look at these things always from an astronomical perspective, uh, not to say anything against our aero, um, aeronautical component, but we, uh, we exist somewhere out here in the uh, Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy another perspective from where we are in the universe. So where do we begin with this all? Um, typically, uh, especially with crewed space flight to date, we begin on the, west, on the east coast of central Florida at the Kennedy Space Center where we've launched a great many missions, both crewed and uh, uncrewed or spacecraft. In the models and sims world, we begin with a model and with data. But, you know, we might 
build a model. It might not look as nice as the one on the left-hand side of the screen. But we also have to gather a bunch of data. It's not just a little data. It's a lot of data. And we ask ourselves then, what comes first? It's that proverbial story of the chicken and the egg. What comes first, the model or the data? And that's always an interesting point of contention with people. Um, and then you have this set of modelers out there who are typically engineers or scientists, but not always. Uh, models can be built just as well by economists or uh, designers of any kind. Uh, but what the customer really wants are credible results so that they may take positive action um, with those results with respect to the real world system that the model represents. Okay, so the, we have this life cycle for a model. If you ask developers of these things, they would like the life cycle to be this simple. They would like to say, we develop the model, then we use it, and all goes on. And when they're presenting to their customers, they show things that they are very proud of because they've spent a lot of time in doing it. And they always think, aren't these results great? How can you not accept this model or this analysis of these results, right? But from a customer's perspective, for someone who is taking that information, what they really need to think is how do I know that the results of this model or sim-based analysis is not a Borg queen? And hopefully uh, the audience is at least mostly literate in, uh, in Star Trek because I use a lot of analogies from there, as you might imagine um, working for NASA, though that's not uh, entirely true for everybody. So you think, okay, what, what does this guy mean by a board queen? And it is some odd mixture of models and data that just isn't pretty. Right? So we go about this process of, okay, let's think about more details. Okay, how do we get quality built into a model and how we're able to communicate it? So from a development perspective, the modeler, Okay, the person building the model or the simulation, they know some system exists. They have this idea for how a model can help. They immediately sit down at the computer, perhaps, start coding the model. They get some results, and they give an answer and say, like little Jack Horner, what a good boy am I? And then they're given reason to pause, wondering, well, is that answer really correct? And so we try to expand on this topic of what model development really is so that we can bolster the evidence that says, yes, we have a good answer when we um, come up with one. So we're going to be getting into the tenets of NASA Standard 7009 here that happened after the Space Shuttle Columbia accident, as I mentioned earlier. The first thing to do is an establish an intended use for the model. Okay? There's a section in the handbook um, in particular that tells what things to include in an intended use statement, but it can be as short as a sentence or maybe a paragraph on what you expect the model to do and what you expect to get out of it. That's the simple part of it, okay? You can there then expound upon that, develop requirements and details for what might need to go into the model and how you might verify and validate it, which we'll get into a little bit more later. So with this statement of intended use and this notion of what you know, 
that I finished my presentation and didn't realize anything was disconnected until nobody replied when I finished. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> um, it, yeah, nothing. Is this where we got cut off? Yes. Okay. I'm going to blow through this very quickly. That must have only been 15 minutes in, right? Yes, approximately. So, you, like I said, you have about 15 minutes left. Okay. If somebody can keep giving me feedback, that would be really nice because I had no idea we were offline. Um, so, one of the first things you do when you're trying to develop an M&S is establish its intended use which is the expected purpose and application of an MS. That is the beginning of developing the requirements or expectations of what we expect the MS to be. The other thing is to develop a plan for the MS life cycle from development through use. Okay? And during the course of uh, the Rev A development of NASA Standard 7009, it became obvious that it was unclear when certain things occurred in a particular order of developing a model or sim. Okay. So this helped nail this down quite nicely. Um, there are, of course, more details associated with it, with a couple of key concepts being making sure that the model design is validated with the customer prior to completing model construction and then also getting into model testing of verification and validation before you actually release a model. So we all know during the course of the development of any real-world system or of any model that recurrent loops can happen if you happen to run into problems or you find you're not doing things correctly or you're not getting the results you expect out of an m &S. You have to go back to where the problem occurred and fix them and then continue on through. Uh, there are also other various life cycles that can be used, not just the waterfall or linear approach like is approached in NASA 7009, which is called the traditional waterfall. There's also iterative, spiral, and agile development processes. But when you look at all of them, they all have a similar theme associated with them. You begin the, the life cycle phase or a spiral agile phase, a sprint, if you will, with planning of what you're going to do during that particular phase. Designing and development, build or construction, and then testing to make sure it does indeed do what you think it's supposed to do. The other thing is understanding criticality. Um, the, we developed this. You've probably seen five by five matrices before. But the intention of a criticality assessment is to communicate, okay, what the decision consequences associated with the model or sim might be, okay, and how much influence the MS results has on that on a particular decision. Okay. And I'm going through this really quickly, second time through. Uh, the other key concept is making sure there is evidence available to the model, model practitioners or the customers, okay, because the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. And by writing it down, we mean keeping a record, an artifact, something in a database perhaps. The word of the, of this, of the decade right now is metadata, okay, which is all very much the same thing. It's done in a slightly different way. But we've had metadata, or we've had documentation in the past um, up through now. The standard includes quite a few requirements on documentation, some recommendations as well. Okay. So the idea is during the process of the life cycle phases of development, you gather up these, this list of things, you know, starting out with that intended use and an understanding of criticality as you go through and build up getting the operational model in hand before you enter the model use phase. Okay? Once you are in the model use phase, it is really important 
to understand what the proposed use of a model might be, assuming it's different, okay, from the permissible uses that have been uh, determined at the end of uh, the development cycle of a model or sim. So making sure that the model is going to produce what is needed for a particular proposed use, okay, with the appropriate accuracy and precision. Okay, so we have these results that come out of a model or sim. You're going to report them to your customer and they want to make a decision on what the implications are to a real world system. Are those results credible so they can take positive action? So there are other things that need to get reported along with the results, okay? An assessment of m and risk. Were there any caveats? I'll talk about that briefly uh, in a minute. The uncertainty of the results, okay? The credibility of the results. Were there any technical reviews, qualifications of the people, and the amount of evidence available, okay? But this idea of risk is going off and assessing many of these things that are reported and get a risk profile in accepting those results, okay? So you might ask, what, are, what do we mean by caveats? Caveats are things that happen during the course of development or use that might negatively influence the results, okay? Like if you have a computational model and you get warnings or errors from either the model or the computer running the model, okay? you might want to be able to resolve those and explain them in a certain way, okay? Or they may say that the results are invalid at that particular point, okay? There are lots of things to think about in caveats. And then there's this idea of credibility, okay, of which there are a number of factors. Talking about those factors on this particular chart, um, it, it seems like a, a lot to report along with a model or sim but they may influence the results. And you must be able to tell your customer or your stakeholder what those uh, implications are, okay? In data pedigree, like where the data came from that you used in building the model. How complete was verification done, testing done? How close do the, does the model produce results uh, similar to the real world system, okay? How good is the data being used to do a particular analysis, okay? Uncertainty is one of those topics that a lot of people shy away from because it can get extremely complica complicated quickly. But there are easy ways to step into this idea of results uncertainty in simply understanding the sources of where they are in the model, categorizing them into what kind of uncertainty it is, and their magnitude. Is it small, even qualitatively? Are the uncertainties small, medium, or large? Is a step towards understanding them a whole lot better before you get into the statistical analysis that many books have been written about in results uncertainty. And then what is the effect of variation of the inputs on the results, which is this idea of results sensitivity? And then, you know, how long has the model been around? How similar is the current use to previous uses? And is there any kind of discipline control used uh, with the products and processes of developing and using the model? Okay, so credibility can be a very simple task. You can get into the details. In the standard, we have this matrix of assessing each of the factors of credibility from having insufficient evidence at the low levels up to near perfection, if you will, or absolute best possible in the level four. And sometimes level four is not reachable, and that is okay. okay? Then we get into this idea of risk. We have defined m and risk as the potential shortfalls in the m and with respect to sufficiently representing the real world system. Okay. What are those shortfalls? They are abstractions taken during the development of the model or sim, assumptions that may have been taken, 
and all models, period, end of subject, all models are abstractions and all models have assumptions associated with them, okay, as well as some uncertainties that either come from the real world or come from the way the modeler implemented their representation of the real world system. So that topic of uncertainty is, is very large. Okay. Other shortfalls might be incomplete verification, incomplete validation, and using a model in extrapolation. Another big topic. So, finishing up now for the second time, what is needed to have quality models and sims and results that result from them? Is you have to have an understanding of the real world system along with the criticality that the model is going to represent. Okay? Establish a plan. That's the MS life cycle. Choose one. Go with it. Document what you do, report openly, completely, and clearly. It's not just about the results, okay? It's also about all that other information that they showed on the previous charts that support the credibility of those results. And go and understand, that is, assess that the use is what is needed, okay? That the proposed use matches the permissible use of the model. Assess the results credibility with those eight factors at least. In some types of models or sims, there may be more factors than that. And then assess the risk of accepting those results and making decisions for the real world system based on those results. And then with that, boldly go where no one has gone before with your models and sims. And I just wanted to say we have a public website that is meant to be for global collaboration on the topic of models and sims. This website goes into a lot more details than what is included in this presentation. Uh, but I invite you to go do that and provide comments back to me. If you hit the uh, MNS forum or contact us, those emails will get to me directly. And then if you want to pull down the standard or the handbook or files from the, the handbook that you might find useful, like the worksheet of development and use of a model or sim, they are all publicly available along with the lessons learned that we had during uh, one of the applications of the standard to a model or sim project. And then the last chart is if you uh, were confused about some of the acronyms I provided them. So hopefully, uh, can people still hear me now? No, we got through it, Martin. That was great. So wow. <laughs> in, any wrap-up comments you want to make? You have just a few minutes left. Uh, no, second time through was good for me. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, we're going to start off with some questions. And I'm going to be so bold as to ask the first one. Is there something that the tool vendors or PLM system providers can do to help us measure our model quality and credibility? Is there functionality available for some of the tools, maybe? Any suggestions there? That's... Um Tough, tough question because it's very broad. Um, but I would, I'd say the first thing that really comes to mind is being very clear on the limits that the model can represent. Okay, so that it's easy for a model developer to say, "I can use this feature or this component that is available in this particular application," but um, it's limits like it's, it's ranges of values that you can use in a particular um, 
a parameter or variable are very clear. And that, that's not always the case. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, the vendor will provide, oh, here's the parameters for this particular modeling block, let's say. But you, you don't know what the upper and lower limits of that block necessarily are all the time. And that's absolutely critical to know that we shouldn't be using this particular modeling item um, with, with variable uh, values or parameter values below or above certain points. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind, Mark. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good answer. So I was kind of baiting you for the question about how important is it to be able to manage metadata that's associated with these models. Many of the slides that you shared describe some of the metadata that is associated with these models. Yes, they certainly do, and, and that is the proverbial $64,000 question, right? So. Yes, I provided a lot of information in here, and managing all of that is not the task of NASA Standard 7009. Somebody has got to go do that. Uh, there's got to be mechanisms uh, for doing that. And the simpler and the easier, the better. And there are a couple out there that, that I have been made aware of. I believe you were presenting on one called uh, MOSSEC and, um, yeah. and, and Share Space. That is certainly one way uh, to do that. There are others that are getting developed out there in the world. But management of all that data and being able to um, keep with that the um, the understanding of credibility associated with that data is is also very important because it, if you have a number out there that's in a database and it's the number's five, how does anybody know that number's any good? So there has to be supporting evidence of what of what that number is and where it came from. Okay. Would you take us back to like slide 25 in your presentation, the table with the uh, different levels of risk, oh, the colored one? Uh, oh. Yes. That one? 33. Yes, please. So how appropriate are these credibility levels to other types of models, related models, consumers of the simulation model, or provisional providers to the simulation model? Okay, these, um, the first three in particular are very development oriented, okay? So they are for the, the M&S developers and practitioners. The middle three are really associated with the use of the model. So if, you know, it, this varies from project to project, but, you know, sometimes the developer is also the user, is also the supporter, and so that one person or that one team does everything. But if you have handoffs, uh, that's where you would split these out. Now these, these, um, this, these two columns on supporting evidence really apply to both development and operations, okay? Because understanding the history of a model and the process product management should be done throughout the entire life cycle. Uh, so very appropriate. Uh, Again, the development ones for developers, the, the operations ones for users. I hope I answered your question. No, very good. Thank you. Okay. So, hey, Cheryl, Mark, this, I, I, I don't see any other questions. Go ahead. Yeah, Mark, this is Kenny. Uh, so, Kenny, on uh, one of the panelists here, and uh, this discussion is fascinating, and, and I'm, I'm struck by the really the focus on the need to, to understand really your data, the provenance of your data, and, and the pedigree that goes with it. I'm curious, um, Martin, if you've heard of ISO 8000 data quality? Yes, I certainly have. And, and that we, there's definitely um, overlaps of the Venn diagram circles with that. 
because, you know, to, in, to some people, uh, models are nothing but data, okay? So, um, and then others would split that hair a little bit, say models are models and data is used to make models. But, uh, yeah, there, there's certainly some overlap, and we, can, we could definitely do with some more um, uh, discussions between the two communities. Excellent. Thank you. I can help you with that. Oh, very good. Um, <laughs> if, if my email isn't available, I think Mark can get it to everybody. Um, uh, so please do so. martin.j.steel at nasa.gov. Yep, he's all over the web. All you have to do is search Martin Steele. So, <laughs> wow. Any, I, any any other questions, Cheryl? That you see on the panels? I've never searched for myself, so I don't know that. <laughs> you should always do that. You never know what you'll find. Um, Mark, no, there are no more questions at the moment, and it looks like we've got perfect timing for a break. So, Mark, if you want to introduce that, and this was a fascinating presentation, and uh, so thanks for doing it.